Welcome back. We're still <clears throat> working through Revelation 17. Uh, are getting weary after a week of this? You can only dump so much water into a cup and it starts to just flow out, right? I thank you for your participation because I had a burden to get this on tape and uh, you can't do it like this without an audience. And I realize these have been long days. Um, they've been fun days. I like doing this, but I know they've been long days. Okay, where we are at now, we raced through verse 9 where... Uh, it says, And here is the mind which hath wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sitteth. Uh, one of the points here is that the woman of Revelation 17 is the one that is over and over again portrayed as sitting. She's, she's the one that is setting upon the threefold union of the beast, dragon, and false prophet. We've dealt with that, and Revelation 17 certainly emphasizes that. And one level of truth in verse 9 is that this is the city of Rome, the seven-hilled city, and the seven heads and seven mountains can be um, understood to be the combination of church and state which she rules over during this time period. Now, if you turn back to Revelation 13, 8, um, I, I was taught something and I was a um, not very diligent prophecy student because I forgot it and then in between the break the brother who taught it to me reminded it to me reminded me of it again in verse 8 it says and all that dwell upon the earth of this revelation 13 and all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him whose names are not written in the book of life slain from the foundation of the world and the operative um, word there is all that dwell upon the earth whose names are not written in the book of life slain from the foundation of the world. I've lost my train of thought on that verse. Brother Robert, help me. Are not? Are not means probation is still open. But yes, yes, okay. It's, there's still probation open here. Their, their names are not there, and you'll see what we mean when you go up to verse 8 of Revelation 17. Now, that's probably why I forgot it. It's, it's just not sticking in there. In verse 8, we pointed out that one of the characteristics of the beast that was and is not is that in the middle of verse 8, they that dwell on the earth shall wonder whose names were not written in the book of life, identifying that this is a portrayal of the papacy at the very end of time when probation is closed when the, they've come together um, just before in the time period where the ten kings are going to turn on the woman and burn her with fire and flesh. You see the difference? Are not, were not. Um, but moving on to the riddle part of it, which this is where most of the controversy over Re Re Revelation 17 is cent centered. Let's see what we have here. <clears throat> Yet under one head, the papal power, the people will unite to oppose God and his person and his witnesses. The, the head that rules over this all uh, in verse 9, the one that sets upon um, not only the mountains, the churches, the civil authority, the kings, but the waters, all the people, is the papacy. The riddle. And there are seven kings. Five are fallen, and one is, and another is not yet come. And when he cometh, he must continue a short space. And the beast that was and is not, even he is the eighth, and is of the seven and goeth into perdition. In verse 11, I think we've already nailed that down, and uh, Rome always comes up eight and is of the seven. So we see in verse 11 that the beast that was and is not is Rome. This would be modern Rome at the end of the world, and this we factor back into verse eight as we've already done. So we know that the eighth, if we're gonna start through identifying these, is modern Rome. Um, so. These kings, what are they? Thou, O king, thou, O king, art this head of gold, Daniel 2. A king is a kingdom. The kingdom is a Bible prophecy in the book of Daniel. And if you drop down to the bottom quote there, um, a quote we've read more than once, in the, book of in the book of Revelation, the same line of prophecy is taken up as in Daniel. 
And the kingdoms of Bible prophecy are established in the book of Daniel. And kings, seven kings, are kingdoms. The kingdoms of Bible prophecy are Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, pagan Rome, paper Rome. Five are fallen. Why are they fallen? Because John is right here at this time period in Earth's history. Five have fallen. And there they are. One is the United States um, comes into history in 1776, which is, let me put it back here, 1776. It starts, and I mean, you can even put the United States before that, but in terms of independence. independence. In the time period when John saw the fifth kingdom of power, the papacy, as fallen, five are fallen, the one that is, that began in 1776, before the 1798 time period, is the United States, and one is yet to come. And we read a few quotes where um, Sister White says, the next kingdom um, to follow the papacy is the United States. That's a paraphrase, but they're very clear where we read them. And there are seven kings, one is yet to come. When he cometh, he must continue a short space. So of the seven kings, this one hasn't come yet, the seventh king. And uh, in verse 12, it says, And the ten horns which thou sawest are ten kings who have received no kingdom as yet. So one uh, is yet to come, and the ten kings have received no kingdom as yet. It's obvious that the seventh kingdom is this one that has not yet come, and they are the ten horns, and one of the, but they receive power as kings one hour with the beast. The seventh kingdom has re received no kingdom. The ten horns have no kingdom yet. And, and there are seven kings. The seventh king has received no kingdom as yet, and the ten horns have received no kingdom as yet. The seventh king is the ten horns. The seventh king continues a short space, and the ten horns receive power as kings one hour. So when dealing with uh, the ten kings, it emphasizes that the, the shortness of time that they will rule uh, by, in one place, saying short space, in another place, saying one hour. And I had a question uh, before a couple meetings ago, a question that often comes up about Revelation 18 and uh, how Babylon will um, receive her judgment in one hour. And my standard response to that, which I think is valid, is that um, time shall be no longer based on Revelation 10, so we're not looking for prophetic time. And this word hour here in Revelation 18 and Revelation 17 is the same Greek word that we find in Revelation 14, which says the hour of his judgment is come. If we're going to apply prophetic time to that Greek word in Revelation 18 and Revelation 17, then to be consistent, we need to apply it in Revelation 14, which would mean the judgment came to a close somewhere in November of 1844. Time shall be no longer. This hour is a short period of time at the end of the world, a short space. That's what's being identified, I believe. And the ten horns which thou sawest are ten kings which have received no kingdom as yet, received powers as kings one hour with the beast, verse 12. So the five that are falling, fallen, we put up here, these five, one is the United States, 1776, and the ten kings are the ones um, that are yet to come. And the beast that was and is not, even he is the eighth. We've already dealt with Rome is of the seven and always come up, comes up eighth, and that's just what the beast that was is identified here. Um, the eighth king is the papacy, whose deadly wound is healed. It is of the seven previous kingdoms, for it is number five. It is the kingdom that prophetically received the deadly wound. Rome is of the seven and always comes up eight. Eight symbolizes resurrection. On the eighth day, Christ was resurrected. Eight people went from the old to the new world on the ark. In the eighth millennium, the earth is made new. Men are to be circumcised on the eighth day, repre representing baptism. The papacy is resurrected when its deadly wound is healed. It is of the seven. It's the fifth kingdom of Bible prophecy who received a deadly wound. Now, <clears throat> this to me is uh, what we're going to say here is, 
an important point to make uh, um, in this sense. Whether you take the, the false understandings, I'm, I'm, I'm believing this is the correct understanding of Revelation 17, okay? So I'm going to present it as such. But there are some other understandings in Adventism about these uh, that I'm going to say are the false ones, okay? And whether you believe the false ones or this correct one, one of them that, one thing that we all have in common is that when we portray these kingdoms, we portray them sequentially. This is the first, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth kingdom. I think that is, that is correct. I think that's correct in a sense, in a sense, but I think there's something more to it. And, and what I mean by that is that Revelation 17 opened, um, opened with, uh, I should have looked at my notes, opened with, with an angel coming from Revelation 16 to bring this message, okay? So we have, to, we have to put together Revelation 17 in connection with Revelation 16. And the story of Revelation 17 is the story of the healing wound, of the deadly wound. It's the same story of Daniel 11, 40 to 45, but in Daniel 11, 40 to 45, the main subject was the papacy, the king of the north. It tells the papacy's movements as the deadly wound is healed. Revelation 13 is the story of the healing to the deadly wound. That's where we get the phrase, the deadly wound. Only there, it's not so much focusing on the papacy as it is the role of the false prophet, the United States, the lamb-like beast. Revelation 17 is the story of the healing of the deadly wound. But it's telling the role of the ten kings, the dragon power. Same story, they must be brought together. That's why if you're, really, if you're going to understand Revelation 17 to the level that we need to understand it, you've got to, you, ha, you need to see the role of the false prophet in Revelation 17, even though it's not specifically addressed in there. But you also need to acknowledge that modern Babylon, the great city, what, what do we know about modern Babylon, the great city that we've been dealing with all week long? Main thing we've been hitting on about modern Babylon all week long, it comes in three parts. The beast, the dragon, and the false prophet. And the angel that came from Revelation 16, that's where we get that information. The great city was divided into three parts. So the healing of the deadly wound, among other things, is telling how the modern papacy takes control of the world. But when modern Rome takes control of the world, she's made up of three parts, the beast, dragon, and the false prophet. So, when it comes to this as a sequence, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, there is light to be found in that sequence. But in reality, the story that's being told down here in this time is the same story as Revelation 13, the same story as Daniel 11, 40 to 45. It's how the deadly wound is healed, how modern Babylon is put in place. So, even though I'm not denying this sequence that the United States is the sixth kingdom, and the United Nations is the seventh kingdom, because that's true. Um, and, and it is an argument in favor of Daniel 11, 40 to 45, because what do you see here? You see that first, the glorious land is conquered, the United States. And then second, Egypt is conquered. It's the same sequence as Revelation 13 and Daniel 11. Glorious land, Egypt, Image of the beast in the United States, verse 11, when the United States speaks as a dragon. And then verses 14 and 15, the United States tells the whole world to set up an image of the beast. So the, the sequence is important and the sequence is sound. But in reality, these three kingdoms are telling the story of how these three kingdoms come together in a threefold union at the end of the world. It's, it's bringing together its testimony with Revelation 16 about how modern Babylon is is divided into three parts, and this is the false prophet. This is the dragon power. Kings, governors, and rulers are represented as the dragon that goes to make war with the saints, and this is the beast. You see what I, you see what I mean? So in one sense, in one sense, this kingdom, this threefold kingdom, in one sense, it's actually the sixth kingdom a Bible prophecy, because this final kingdom is made up of these three kingdoms. But in that sense, when you take these three entities, the United States, the United Nations, and Rome, and you say that they're the sixth kingdom, you come up with six, six, six. 
if you identify them as the sixth kingdom, which is valid, but it's also valid to view them in their sequential order because there is light there too. Get the logic? Revelation 17, 16, and 17. And the ten horns which thou sawest upon the beast, these shall hate the whore, and shall make her desolate and naked, and shall eat her flesh, and burn her with fire. For God hath put in their hearts to fulfill his will, and to agree, and give their kingdom unto the beast, until the words of God shall be fulfilled. The ten horns are going to agree to give their kingdom. What is their kingdom? It's the seventh kingdom. So they are, some kind of agreement is going to be struck in this threefold arrangement. Some people can't see this board. As big as this board is, we got the podium blocking it, huh? Too bad. That, well, it's okay. Um, there's going to be an agreement struck between these three powers that, that this power, the United Nations, is going to agree to give its kingdom unto the papacy. And... Um, you can see it coming to pass in the world today. You can see the United States is on the road where it's going to begin pursuing radical Islam as things escalate, and it hasn't even got enough men to deal with Iraq. And it's more than, I don't want to make no predictions, I get in trouble on that. But I, it's, you can see how very easily uh, the United States could get drawn hither and yon and be stretched so thin that they're going to insist that the only way to solve this problem is to bring the United Nations in as the, the police unit. Um, the, the Army of the United States can be the front line, but the cleanup operations and the crowd control can be turned over to the United Nations. They're going to come together. Now, that's just talking about the dynamics of what's going on in the world today, but we know, along with that, the United States passes a Sunday law, and what happens? National apostasy is followed by national ruins. Satan appears on the scene and starts pushing his agenda. And so things escalate very rapidly, and they get really out of hand. So, I mean, we're talking about going into a crisis that no human pen can portray. I mean, what's going to happen? We don't, it's beyond ability of human pen to describe it. And... In this situation, the ten horns are going to agree. There's an agreement struck to give their kingdom, the seventh kingdom of the beast. Now, what is this? What is their kingdom? It's the seventh kingdom, and they're going to agree to give it. Brothers and sisters, it's their birthday. They're going to, their agreement is, yes, we'll take our kingdom, and we'll agree to give it to the beast at the identical time. This is Herod's birthday. This is Herod's birthday. This is the deception. This is the dance of deception of Salome. This is right where the bloodbath symbolized by John the Baptist's head, takes place in this agreement. That's how I see it in the story of Elijah. They hate and destroy Rome, these ten kings. And the ten horns which thou sawest upon the beast, these shall hate the whore, and shall make her desolate and naked, and shall eat her flesh and burn her with fire, for God hath put it in their hearts to fulfill his will. And they agree to give their kingdom to the beast, to agree and give their kingdom unto the beast until the words of God shall be fulfilled. The woman controls the kings, and the woman which thou sawest is that great city which reigneth over the kings of the earth. It is the woman that is in control. This is clearly a definition of the image of the beast. This is the same image of the beast as verse 14 and 15 of Revelation 13. And how does it come to pass? It comes to pass by verses 12 through 14 of Revelation 13, the United States, the false prophet, deceives the world to set up an image of the beast. And how does it deceive the world? It uses its military power. It's the United States that is the power. It's the dragon, it's the civil authority that agrees to give its kingdom, its civil authority, to the beast. Has that ever happened in the past? Yes. Yes, the civil authority of Rome was given to the beast in 533. This is history repeating. It's repeating. That's why, that's why every Seventh-day Adventist should understand the foundations of Adventism. Because if the pioneers were sitting in the audience right now, and I said, can anyone out there uh, give us a sermon on the year 508? A pioneer would, well, all of them would stand up and say, which one do you want? Or if I said, can any give, you, give us a sermon on 533? All the pioneers would stand up. They all knew these dates. They knew these histories. This was the foundation of Adventism. If you don't think so, if you don't think so, if you think I'm stretching it, look at the pioneer charts. Look at the pioneer charts. 
That's what they are. It's those dates. It's that history. That's what they were setting before the people. Remember the quote? Historical events were set before the people and prophecy was seen to be a figurative delineation of events leading down to the close of this earth's history. That's the prophetic historical events they were setting before the people. Now, these ten kings. This is from Seventh-day Adventist Bible Commentary, page 983. Revelation 13 and 14 quoted. Let's we did this already, but let's, let's make sure about this. These have one mind and shall give their power and strength unto the beast. This is these ten horns. And they shall make war with the lamb, and the lamb shall overcome them, for he is Lord of lords and king of kings, and they that are with him are called and chosen and faithful. Revelation 17, 13, and 14. These have one mind. There will be a universal bond of union. That may have only been a proposal over there, that um, map that was proposed by the um, the G7 as a way to uh, you know, control the world if a one world government is in place. But it doesn't matter. The ten horns symbolize a civil government that encompasses the whole world and it will be a universal bond of union. This is a worldwide bond of union. One great har harmony, a confederacy of Satan's forces and shall give their power and strength unto the beast. What at that time, what is the power of the United Nations? It's the United States. It's there. The United Nations is not the, the, the entity in end-time Bible prophecy. The dragon power is not the entity in end-time Bible prophecy that has the power. They're the ones that have the authority. But do you think that the United States is going to force the world to accept the United Nations as a one-world government and then just step back and say we don't have anything to do with it? No, the United States is going to insist that the world accept the United Nations as a one world government and the United States is going to be right there in the middle of it because they're the ones that are foisting the world to accept it. So when we see the ten kings and it's speaking about them using their power, that power is military power that comes from the United States. That's the obvious conclusion when you bring Daniel 11, Revelation 13, Revelation 16, Revelation 17, together, as we should do as students of prophecy. And they shall give their power and strength unto the beast. And of course, that's why Sister White says, the United States is the last power to oppose God and his people. It's not the ten kings, according to Sister White. It's the United States. So the United States has to be part of the ten kings. And we've read that quote a couple times here. You have it in your notes if you don't remember it. Thus is manifested the same arbitrary oppressive power against religious liberty, freedom to worship God according to the dictates of conscience as was manifested by the papacy when in the past it persecuted those who dared to refuse to conform with the religious rites and ceremonies of Romanism in the warfare to be waged in the last days there will be united in opposition to God's people all the corrupt powers that have apostatized from the allegiance to the law of God. Who's all the corrupt powers? The beast, the dragon, and the false prophet, which encompasses the whole world except for God's people. In this warfare, the Sabbath of the fourth commandment would be the great point of issue for this. In the Sabbath commandment, the great lawgiver identifies himself as the creator of heaven and earth. The Lord declares through the prophet Isaiah, Isaiah 8, 9 through 13 quoted, this is the evil confederacy we've read a passage about this. This is a different passage. Sister White speaks about this evil confederacy in several places. Um, this is a different one. It says, after quoting Isaiah 8, 9 through 13, she says, and there are those who question whether it is right for Christians to belong to Freemasons and other secret societies. The evil confederacy at the end of the world has a direct connection with Masonry. And brothers and sisters, the United Nations doesn't deny its connection with Masonry and Freemasonry. It's easy. It's easy history to find. That's, that's the, you know, that's what they're made up of, Freemasonry. Let all such consider the scriptures just quoted. Let all such consider the scriptures just quoted. If we are Christians at all, we must be Christians everywhere and must consider and heed the counsel given to make us Christians according to the standards of God's word. Now here's another one about Isaiah 8. We'll get to it on the next page. The spirit of covetousness. What's the covetousness? The love of money. World banking system, perhaps? The spirit of covetousness had led men to seek worldly advantage, and by extravagance and display they've tried to hide their wicked deeds, which they have done in order to reach their object. 
Men occupying high positions of trust, high positions of trust, have revealed this unlawful desire for gain. You know, if you listen to the political cam that pain that just got over, you'd hear John Kerry trying to get the American people to believe that the Bush family had some connection with oil money. Uh, do you think he does? <laughs> Men occupying high positions of trust have revealed this unlawful desire for gain. They have practiced extortion and robbery and have gratified, you know, in the United States right now, for those of you visiting from outside the United States, gasoline's getting a little bit irritating that it's costing so much money over here, isn't it? What's the justification for that anyway? Of course, we can't say nothing to the Europeans because they're paying about three times as much as we are. But what's the justification for that? Somebody needs a little bit more money in their pocket. That's about all the logic I think that you could really bring to bear on that subject. <laughs> Men occupying high positions of trust have revealed this unlawful desire for gain. They have practiced extortion and robbery and have gratified the evil passions of their heart until our cities are corrupted through their wickedness. God has declared that he will uncover the works of deceit and robbery by their own working. In some cases, the judgments of God have already fallen heavily on these cities. The Lord spake thus to me with a strong hand and instructed me that I should not walk the way of this people. Say ye not a confederacy to all to whom this people shall say. She's talking about people that are into money in high positions of trust. And then she goes to the evil confederacy of Isaiah 8. Brothers and sisters, the United Nations, the world banking system, that's the same bunch of guys. And if they control the money of the world, that's also easy to document, even in the United States. Select the Messages, Book 2, page 131. In the revelation of his righteous judgment, God will break up all these associations, and when the judgment shall sit and the books be opened, there will be revealed the unchristlikeness of the whole confederacy. Those who choose to unite with these secret societies are pay me, paying homage to idols as senseless and powerless to bless and save the soul as are the gods of the Hindus. Brothers and sisters, where you get this map over here from is from a book called En Route to Global Occupation by Gary Cobb that was some type of diplomat for the United States government that did not believe in any conspiracy think, theories, but as he began to work the diplomatic work that he did for the United States government, he kept running into what he, you know, was this secret conspiracy. So after he got convinced that he'd been wrong and that there was a conspiracy to rule the world through the banking system and through a one world government, he began to put documents together. And that's what the book is, En Route to Global Occupation. And there's a lot of books out there like that. I like that one because it's just simple, basic history. But he wrote a second book. And it was called Roots to Global Occupation or some close facsimile in the name. And you know what he did then? After he'd established... The United Nations being the one world government that takes place at the end of the world. And in his second book, Roots to Global Occupation, he went in and documented that the men that run, the, the main players in the United Nations that run the United Nations, they hold a position of trust in another uh, niche of society. You know what it is? They're the leaders of the New Age movement. It's the same men. And here, Sister White's talking about this it's evil confederacy, and she says their religion is, is powerless to bless and save the soul as are the gods of the Hindus. What's the Hindu religion? Spiritualism. The dragon powers religion is spiritualism, and the religion of the United Nations is spiritualism, and it is easy to document. These societies offer some advantages. They offer some advantages, but I don't know to who. The United States, uh, people in the United States didn't have much of an opportunity to to pick this year because both the people running for office were members of the Skull and Bones Society, which is nothing more than a carry-on from a group of men called the Knights of the Templar from about the 11th century, the same people that for hundreds of years have been taking to rule, to, attempting to take over the world through money. These societies offer some advantages which, for, which from a human point of view appear like great blessings, but not so when judged by the Lord's measurement. Behind their apparent advantages are concealed satanic agencies. 
This is another one. Spiritualism asserts that men are unfallen demigods, that each mind will judge itself, and that true knowledge is places men above all law, that all sins committed are innocent, for whatever is right is right, and God doth not condemn. The basest of human beings it represents as in heaven, and highly exalted there, thus it declares to all men, it matters not what you do, live as you please, heaven is your home. Multitudes are thus led to believe that desire is the highest law, and license is liberty, and that man is accountable only to himself. With such teaching giving at, every, at the very outset of life, when impulse is strongest and the demand for self-restraint and purity is most urgent, where are the safeguards of virtue? What is to prevent the world from becoming, becoming a second Sodom? I'm a second Sodom. A second Sodom, what's that ring of? French Revolution, perhaps? One of the premier pillars of France, a second Sodom. At the same time, anarchy is seeking to sweep away all lot, all law, thinking of Sodom, all lot, all law, not only divine but human, the centralizing of wealth and power. The world banking system, does, it, does that sound like what we're talking about here? The centralizing of wealth and power? the vast combinations for the enriching of a few at the expense of many, the combination of poorer classes for the defense of their interests and claims, the spirit of unrest and riot and bloodshed, the worldwide dissemination of the same teachings that led to the French Revolution are all tending to involve the whole world in a struggle similar to that which convulsed France. Brothers and sisters, this dragon power over here, uh, its religion is spiritualism, its political manifestation is what we call socialism. And socialism is nothing more than the modern-day version of uh, the atheism that began in France. This is, in, and it's the United Nations way of operations. The United Nations is not a democracy. I mean, you, you probably remember the Soviet Union. It had the Politburo, a group of men that made the decisions and could owned everything. Well, that's what the United Nations is. Only they don't call it the Politburo, the political bureau. They call it the Security Council. And, uh, it's the same thing. That's the structure of the United Nations. The structure, the civil structure that came from France, one of the seven European kings, which is the descendants of pagan Rome, and Rome is the one that gave government to the culture of the world. This is the, the, the highest fruition of civil government to come down through the dragon power, is socialism that came down from Rome, via the highway of the dragon that comes down through history. And the ten horns, Revelation 17, 16. And the ten horns which thou sawest upon the beast, these shall hate the whore, and shall make her desolate and naked, and shall eat her flesh, and burn her with fire. For God hath put in their hearts to fulfill his will, and to agree, and to give their kingdom unto the beast, until the words of God shall be fulfilled. Brothers and sisters, we've, we've dealt a little bit with just the historical dynamics um, that makes this true, but it's very clear that when the Euphrates is dried up, when mankind, it doesn't, it doesn't matter if we're talking about mankind in general, the ten kings realizing that Jezebel has deceived them and that they're lost, or if it's a human being at the same point in time that realized that they believed their pastor and they're lost. What does Sister White say has happened to the pastors at that time that have deceived the flock? They tear them apart limb piece by piece, limb by limb. That's what takes place at this dime, a time period. And the, the premier focus of that deception that the whole world is going to wake up to when the Euphrates is dried up, when the king of the north comes to his end and none shall help him when she's burned with fire, is that the, the great deceiver above and beyond them all is Jezebel, the beast. Any questions? We need a microphone. And we need someone to run the microphone. I'm not sure what you meant when you say on the eighth day Christ was resurrected. Well, I know that <laughs> that's the one uh, number eight that causes people um, a little bit of Shaking. I'm not, I'm not suggesting that Christ was uh, resurrected literally on the eighth day. I'm saying symbolically um, he was resurrected on, on the first day of the week, but the first follows the seventh, so in that sense it's the eighth day of the week. It's, it's just biblical prophecy. You can throw that one out if you want. Though, though, you don't need to use those 
uh, symbols of number eight to make this establish. You just don't. Um, maybe, it's, maybe I'm just trying to be too cute with it, but I, I've seen other people um, use eight as a symbol of resurrection, and that's one of the things that's used. So retract, retract that if you need to. I'm not, it's not. In your uh, explanation of 666 there from Revelation 16, 19, the great city divided into three parts, showing that it's a uh, part, it's the, which was good. I like that. I like it too, but it isn't anything that, you know, it's just, it, it, I'm one of the people that sees 666 a lot of people and think it's probably God's signature. I'm not saying anything about that except, whoa, looky there. Looky there, right. Well, I noticed that in, uh, it also lines up with Revelation 13 too, because the United States is the power, uh, the United Nations is the authority, and Correct. Rome is the uh, seat. seat. That's how it lines up. Yes. Yeah, yeah, that, well, yeah, they go together without a doubt. False prophet, dragon, beast, all of those, yes, they go together. That was the point. Even the, the histories you can line up with the, um, the three enemies of Bible prophecy. John? I have two questions. The first one is, um, if we look at the chart about the beast, the dragon, and the false prophet, we can see that usually the false prophet is the plural power. But um, in the end, the dragon is the plural power. Does, does that mean anything? That's the first question. Well, let me you? answer the first question. Okay. Um, I answered that question the other night, how I understand it. I'll answer it again, how I understand it, is that um, I'm not trying to suggest anything here. Because from my studies, if, if you're going to say who the plural power is, it's the dragon for this reason. Um, in both its religious manifestation and its political manifestation, you'll see that political, politically you can see atheism, socialism, Nazism, Bolshevism. There, there's a whole variety of political manifestations that come under the umbrella of socialism, and the same with its religion. A whole variety of spiritualistic religions that come under the broad umbrella of spiritualism. That's one point. The second point is, is that the dragon power, as it comes down through history, it has the number 10 associated with it. Uh, whether it's pagan Rome or the ten toes at the end of the world or the ten kingdoms in Psalm 83 or the ten kings here in Revelation 17. And also, it's the continual power that has continually been opposing God and its people and it pops up at different points in history which also leads me to believe, okay, it's the one in plurality. But as you look at these three tribes, that, or these three enemies as they're popped up, in different passages in Bible prophecy, you'll find times when, uh, like the, the priest of Baal, are obvious, obviously not the dragon power. That kind of flows. So for me, I use the characteristic of two singular and two plural when it's illustrated to say, yes, this is modern Babylon. But I don't take the next step and try to be, and try to nail down. Um, where Edom and Sanballat and all these people are playing in each time because you do. Uh, it's obvious that in uh, the story of Jezebel, Ahab is the civil power, but the priest of Baal, you know, that priest plural, you would get yourself a headache. And, uh, okay, next question. That's, my, that's how I understand it. Then about the one hour, um, you interpreted it as a short space. Yes. Um, is that consistent if you take um, the same term um, concerning Revelation 14, where it says the hour of uh, his judgment is come? No, what, what, my answer to that, it, I, I didn't probably follow my thought through here, is that I'm not so much saying that the one hour um, after 1844, when the one, an hour is illustrated in Bible prophecy, means a short space. To me, it means a period of time, like the day of the Lord. Uh, uh, it's it's a, uh, an adjective more than it is a noun. It's a, it's a description of uh, the, I guess an adjective is the right word. So for me, the hour of his judgment has come. Well, I don't try to apply that to it, but had Adventists followed on unitedly in faith, we'd be in heaven ere this. So it could have been a shorter space than it was, but that, I, I really don't want to take that answer to you. Um, I just don't believe it's 
what's an hour break down to? One twenty-fourth of a day. Fifteen days. Fifteen days. Um, and the reason that I don't want to do it is because time shall be no longer. So for me, the, both the short space, the, the, the ten kings are going to rule um, with one hour, and it says that the, these ten kings will continue for a short space. I put them together. That, those are both terms there in Revelation 17. When you bring them together and you realize they're both connected with the ten horns, it's defining itself that this one hour is a short space, which is consistent with the first story of Babel. It, it, it started, this new world order, this threefold union, is going to attempt to bring the whole world under the umbrella of uh, its authority, and the whole thing comes tumbling down. That's how I understand it. How would you deal with the question or with the statement that there was silence in heaven for the space of a half hour? Did, did we deal with that? Did we, did we read that verse here? Now, did we read that verse? Perhaps that's how I deal with it. But, I'm just curious. But Russell can answer that question, and this question answers for both of us. How, how do you understand in, in the short space or the, the silence in heaven? You, know, you got a response to that, right? Yes, no? Not really. Not really, okay. He's like me. He deals with it by just kind of dealing with other things. You said that, um, is it Papal Rome is against, is for the death decree? And, um, no, sorry, United States is for the death decree. The papacy is against it, but the United... I'm trying to figure out how does the United Nations on a birthday, what, what's that all about? How does that fit in around the death decree? Okay, um, what, I'm, what I said when I brought that in, it was just is a kind of a current event highlight. The United Nations has taken a position against the death decree, against death, okay? You know, they don't believe in capital punishment. And we've seen that come into history with Saddam Hussein in the papers. The United Nations against... Uh, capital punishment, and at that time period, the papacy came out in favor of the United Nations position and say, we don't believe in capital punishment either. The United States was in favor of capital punishment, and so was Iraq. So Saddam Hussein's getting tried in Iraq. The United States won that position. What I'm saying is that when the United States get to the point after the Sunday law that radical Islam and the judgments of God have driven it to its knees and the whole world to its knees, and the king of the north is taking control of Egypt, and the United States forces the whole world to accept this arrangement. There's an agreement struck right in that time period of time where the United Nations says, yes, we're willing to be the civil government of the world. This is what, that's their whole purpose. They've, that's what they are all about. That's what they want, is to bring the whole world under the umbrella of a one-world government. They're going to agree, with, agree to it because uh, somehow, and I don't know the, all the dynamics of the agreement, uh, they're going to be forced to accept the papal power as the moral head, the moral authority. Now, I know this is the case because Revelation 17 says it, but I know it's this case because um, this is what happened in the year 533. The religious crisis then was over, uh, you know, who's the greatest church and the Trinity doctrine and whatever. Our religious crisis is going to be radical Islam. So the United States is going to insist that the world accept the United Nations as a one world government. The United States is going to be involved with the United Nations. It's the power of it. But the agreement will be struck right from the beginning because it's, they agree to give their kingdom unto Rome. And so all I'm saying is when you first begin your kingdom for the United States, 1776, July 4th, 1776, we celebrate the birthday of the United States, July 4th, every year. That's its birthday. Herod's birthday was where Salome did the dance of deception that, de that deceived Herod. So I'm suggesting that when the United Nations birthday arrives, that this is when they're going to first begin to rule. And Revelation 17 tells us that when they first begin to rule, they also agree to give their kingdom to the beast. This is the image of the beast of Revelation 13, uh, verses 14 and 15, combination of church and state with the church in ascendancy. So this agreement is struck. 
And at the birthday, at that very outset, is when Herod uh, is deceived because that's when Salome did the dance and came and he says, I'll give you anything. So right there at the very beginning of the United Nations, then I believe that it is going to be portrayed to the United Nations that the real designs of Jezebel is that it doesn't matter what God does. She wants Elijah's life today. And it doesn't uh, matter. We want John the Baptist's head in the basket. This is the dynamics that's being portrayed in, in Herod's birthday, I believe. That's when the deception comes. And the deception is taking place from the point of view that today Rome is saying it doesn't believe in the death decree. But as soon, Sister White, we've read a quote here, all Rome is looking for is vantage ground, and as soon as she has it, she strikes. The vantage ground is when these ten kings give her their kingdom. She has it, she strikes. So th this is the, the point of deception. This is the point of deception. And uh, So that, is that death decree uh, mainly for the um, SDAs? Apps, that's, we know that. That's what Bible prophecy says. And uh, the secondary deception of it is, I believe, is that the, the reason that this is brought upon the world is because the third woe, which is radical Islam, is bringing the whole world to its knees. So the religious crisis that parallels the religious crisis of the time period of Justinian, when Justinian agreed to make Rome the head of the church and the corrector of heretics, is the history that parallels this. Once again, Rome is going to become the corrector of heretics, the United Nations, and the world thinks the heretics that it's going to deal with is radical Islam. So the second part of the deception is not only that she does believe in the death penalty, but that it is not radical Islam that she's going to deal with, but she's going to deal with the people that are upholding the Seventh-day Sabbath. When the Sunday law has already taken place back here. The Sunday law is what really opened the floodgates of this escalating judgments of God. Now, where do you see the escalating of judgments of God in this time period? Daniel 11, verses 42 and 43. That's when the Egyptians are suffering under so many plagues that they agree to give the wealth of Egypt, of the whole world, into the hands of the king of the north. That's the, that's the history of the plagues of Egypt. Um, but if Sab Saddam Hussein um, is... Um um, is still a, um, don't, get, don't get lost on Saddam Hussein. I'm simply saying something in the current events that if we will see it, we can see that this argument, that this deception is being pushed. Saddam Hussein, to me, is... Ask your question, though. Um, if, if he's still a... Well, he probably will be a prisoner then. Would they kind of like use him as a, a, a scapegoat? I don't, I, don't, I, think he's, I don't think he's the issue because they already decided that issue. They decided the Iraqis are going to try him. And let's face it, the Iraqis are going to kill him if time goes on. All I'm, all I'm saying is that because of that, you could see the different positions being taken by the papacy and the United Nations and the United States. And these positions on the death penalty have a direct bearing to the story because these ten kings are going to make war with Christ. And how do these ten kings make war with Christ? They go after God's people. We've read quotes like that already. In, regard, in regards to that, going after God's people, making war with God's people, uh, in our timeline that we had up on the board several times here this week, we discussed uh, the Sunday law and the, the close of probation uh, in the United States for Seventh-day Adventists. And uh, we also talked about uh, the Revelation 18 where the angel comes down uh, in the same uh, or, or, or in greater power than he did uh, in the uh, Revelation 10 in the uh, 1840 Advent movement, yes. the Millerite movement. But what we, what we didn't discuss is uh, if we plug in the United States, the United Nations, and Rome, uh, into their operations after the Sunday law on the timeline. In that same time before uh, probation closes for the world, we have the operation of the th third angel swelling to that loud cry to give the message 
come out of her, my people, and be ye not a partaker of her sins, and receive not of her plagues, for her sins have reached unto heaven. And at the same time, God's people are being, uh, there's a war going on at that time against the people of God. An escalating war. An escalating war. It progresses to the death decree. Right. So I asked you earlier today, you and I had a little talk, and we, we discussed it briefly. Now, at the death decree, we know from great controversy that it goes out against God's people that as the mobs and the people try to kill God's people, that their swords are like straws, correct? All right. Prior to that, we do know that there are some martyrs, we don't know how many, in the cause. Maranatha says many. Many. And when Michael stands up to close probation, is this when uh, the uh, people that have been at war with God's people recognize that they have been deceived? And is this when they burn the whore and eat her flesh? Or is it prior to that? Uh, it's it's fifth plague, which is, comes after Michael stands up. But when you're asking that, um, in the purification of God's church, there was one thing that I pointed out. It's a minor thing, but remember when when Sister White saw Jesus coming out of the most holy place to come to the east to return to the east, east return, coming to the east to return to the earth. It was a number of days. So. You know, technically, prophetically, fifth plague, this is going on. But it's not a long period of time after Michael stands up, from my understanding. It's going to be a period of time, because we're going to have to go through the time of Jacob's trouble, but it's not months and months and months, from my understanding. Uh, we're running out of time for the tape. What, what about the issue of how do they understand that they have been deceived, is what I'm trying to get at. What... what takes them over the edge till they look at Rome and see her as she really is, and they, then they burn her with fire. What tips them over the scale? Ah, good for you. He's raising his hand. Come up here in the, where the camera can get you. The camera didn't get him. <laughs> <laughs> um, the great controversy, when she describes the, the, the final scenes of this Earth's history, she's she says, on the fifth plague, the darkness that covers the, that, that covers the earth, um, the, the people realized at that time, when they realized God's protection or, or light that surrounds his people, they realized that the Adventist people are the people of God, and they realized that they were, that were, they were deceived by the threefold union. And so, they, well, they were deceived by the false religions, and therefore they turned on them and they turn to the leaders first of all and ask them and ask them questions as to the as to whether whether this is so or not and the, 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 the leaders agree to that fact that that they were deceived by them and then Ezekiel chapter 9 that's where Ellen White puts it its fulfillment where this great slaughter begins within um, the false religion shall we pray Heavenly Father, we thank you once again for the time we've spent um, covering these prophecies in the book of Revelation. Lord, we can see this um, threefold union in the world today, active, fulfilling its role. And uh, the only difficult thing to see is God's people. We know, we know they're there. Elijah couldn't see anyone, but there were your people there. So we know your people are around this world. But the numbers seem small, and we want to be among those numbers, and we want to go to work where we can increase those numbers, that a, a mighty group of people can uh, be taken out of Babylon and taken home with you. So somehow, some way, um, enlighten, um, invigorate um, these weak human minds of ours that we can um, see our personal need of the ongoing day-by-day, moment-by-moment presence of your Holy Spirit in our life and that we can also understand these things in such a way that we can give a very clear and concise warning message 
that can only be understood as love by those that hear it. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen.